Welcome back to an introduction to breast cancer. This is a special segment we call Office Hours. So many of you have been actively participating in our discussion boards and asking some really fabulous questions. So we thought we'd answer some of them here live and in person. So let's get started. One of you asked, how are patients impacted by knowing that their breast cancer is heritable? Is an individual better prepared in facing the high possibility of cancer than someone who has never experienced or known that they were susceptible to cancer? I think that's a really individual question. And it's something that's important to think about, especially when we're counseling patients about whether or not they want to undergo genetic testing or at least see a genetic counselor. So certainly these days, a lot of people have heard about hereditary risk. We talked about the Angelina Jolie story, and many celebrities are now coming out and talking about familial risk and the importance of understanding your own family history and your risk. For many patients, that's empowering to know that what their risk is, to know whether or not they carry a particular genetic mutation, and what they can do in a proactive fashion to reduce their risk. If you want more information on that, go back and check out the interview that we did with Erin Hofstadter when we talked about high risk in genetics. Some patients will be really scared about the risk that that imposes in terms of their insurance coverage and so on. But remember that there are federal laws that protect patients uh, from that. So for many patients, knowing that you're at risk is empowering because they can reduce their risk. But for others, it really is a scary prospect. I think it's important to know how you feel about that information. And every patient's going to be different. Let's look at another question. So Christina Wolf asked, have you found that patients you see in your clinic are in general more knowledgeable than before widespread access to online media? If yes, is this a good or a bad thing? Again, this is really patient dependent. Some patients have come in with you know, heaps of information. They've trolled the internet, they've printed out articles, they've gone to discussion boards. Many of them may have even seen this course. And so they come in armed with information. For some patients, that's really empowering too, because they've started to do some of their own research to understand their disease. And so they come in knowing a little bit about what's going on with them, what are their options, and asking really important questions that are relevant to them. Other patients, however, who have done the same exercise may find that that's not very helpful. Sometimes they've talked to other patients or been on discussion boards that make this disease seem really scary. Or they've talked to patients who have had an adverse outcome or have a disease process that is different from theirs and they tend to think that they've got the same thing, which may not be the truth. So in general, my advice is this, talk to your doctor. It's fine if you want to look up information on the internet, but remember that there are certain websites that you can count on and others that may not be so good. Always remember, don't worry until your doctor tells you to worry. At least that's what I tell my patients. So you really want to make sure that you understand your disease process that's going on for you and not what's going on on the internet. For a lot of patients, they just avoid the internet and Dr. Google altogether, see their own doctor first, and that really gives them a fresh start. Oftentimes, your doctor will provide you with additional information, including some websites that they trust where you can go to get more information. Well, then there were a lot of questions on alternative treatments. So William Barnes asked, in the clinical trials, new therapies were tested against the standard therapies. How do these treatments compare to those who reject medical treatment and who choose to treat breast cancer with diet and exercise? How do all of these groups, new therapies, standard therapies, or no or natural therapies, compare to the survival rates of those who have never had breast cancer? Well, those are all really good questions, but you have to remember that we're limited in terms of the data that we have. 
I'm so glad, William, that you started mentioning clinical trials because as all of you know, that's one of my favorite topics. Let's go back and review a couple of things. So you remember that we talked about the NSABP B20 trial. And that was the trial that really looked at chemotherapy and demonstrated that in patients who had breast cancer, that being treated with chemotherapy, if you met certain metrics that made you at more risk of disease progression, was beneficial. And that's really why we started giving patients chemotherapy. Then there were other trials that looked at diet. So remember the WIN study? This was a study by Rowan Chablowski where he took over 2,400 and some odd women who had early stage breast cancer and randomized them. Remember, randomization is a really great trial design that helps us to see the value of an intervention. So he randomized these to see whether a low-fat diet would be associated with an improvement in survival. Now, in that study, because we already knew that these patients would benefit from chemotherapy, and because we know that clinical trials always randomize you to standard of care, which in this day and age is chemotherapy for patients who meet certain criteria, to that which we think is better, so the addition of a low-fat diet, um, that was the study design. It was not against doing nothing because doing nothing would be below what we already knew was standard of care. And so again, it's difficult to answer William's question because at this point, doing a study where we take people who have got breast cancer and do nothing at all and randomize that to doing diet or exercise and randomize that in a three-way fashion to uh, uh, chemotherapy, that would be unethical because doing nothing is below the standard of care. So the WIN study randomized patients to either get uh, standard therapy or to get a low-fat diet. And what they found was that patients who were randomized to the low-fat diet actually did better. There was a survival advantage. Now, there is another study that is going on currently. And remember in the clinical trials segment, I told you to look up a website called clinicaltrials.gov. And I would encourage you to really check that out because you can see what are the current clinical trials going on in your neighborhood and looking at therapies that are of interest to you. So right now, there is a trial going on called Be Well. It stands for Breast Cancer Wellness and Exercise and Lifestyle. So this is a study that is randomizing patients to standard therapy, whether it's with chemotherapy or hormonal therapy, or for some patients, not anything at all, because that is standard therapy. Remember, patients with really small cancers or patients who are lymph node negative might not need additional adjuvant therapy versus an exercise intervention. And so this study will answer the question of, does exercise improve survival? There has never been, to my knowledge, a study that does what you're talking about, William, where you go from no treatment to standard therapy with chemotherapy, for example, to diet and exercise. But given what we know already from a combination of these studies, we know that standard therapy is better than no treatment. We know that adding diet and exercise is better than standard treatment. And so for now, especially given the data that we have, that's usually our recommendation. Take your standard therapy, whether it's chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, um, or nothing, depending on disease status. And you can check out what is standard therapy by going to www.nccn.org, where you can find the latest guidelines of what standard therapy is based on clinical trials and add in diet and exercise. 
remember too that there's a difference between complementary therapies and alternative therapies. So alternative therapies are really when we reject standard therapy and we're taking something instead of. Complementary therapies are taking something in addition to standard therapy. And in general, in this day and age, given how robust the data are for standard therapies, we're often looking at complementary therapies like diet and exercise that can improve outcomes, reduce side effects. So I hope that helps. The next question was about physical therapy. Um, does physical therapy have any role in the management of breast cancer, especially following surgery, like in the case of a lumpectomy? Well, physical therapy is an important part of the breast cancer team. Physical therapy is often very helpful in things like lymphedema. Remember that we had an entire segment looking at the sequelae of axillary node dissection and axillary management. And one of those complications was swelling of the arm. Well, physical therapists are often really helpful in doing things like massage and compression sleeves that can help with reducing that swelling. They can also help with decreased range of motion of the shoulder, which you'll also remember is another potential complication after axillary lymph node surgery or after radiation to the axilla. Physical therapy is less of a benefit after a standard lumpectomy because usually patients don't have a lot of complications after a small surgery like that. But remember, too, that physical therapy is often really helpful in terms of just getting people moving again, lifting weights, walking, exercising. And remember, that's where a lot of the new interventions are coming into play as we start learning about the importance of diet and exercise, maintaining a healthy body weight in terms of improving longevity, and reducing the side effects from even things like chemotherapy. Many people asked about some newer therapies, um, so things like proton therapy. So again, in terms of proton therapy, so for those who aren't familiar, protons, if you think back to physics class, right? Um, when we think about atoms, there's made up of a nucleus, which is made up of protons, which are positively charged particles, neutrons, which are neutral particles, and electrons. Uh, you'll forgive the diagram of my atom. Uh, but if we think about how we accelerate these subatomic particles to generate uh, energy, and we think about energies like radiation therapy, people have started to think about whether protons can actually be used as a form of radiation. Now, the data are not quite mature in the area of breast cancer. There is, however, a clinical trial, imagine that, going on at at least one U.S. institution looking at photon therapy, which is our standard therapy, versus proton therapy to see whether there's a difference, particularly in terms of cardiac risk. Now, some investigators have looked at proton therapy for accelerated partial breast irradiation, Remember going back to our segment on radiation? We talked about standard radiation being to the whole breast, but accelerated partial breast radiation being to just that segment of the breast where the cancer was removed. So people have looked at that too. But again, the data are really early, so stay tuned. One of the things that I will tell you, however, about proton therapy that has made it less appealing to many patients is that it's very expensive. And when we think about the side effects of chemotherapy or any of our therapies, including radiation, we need to think about financial toxicity too. Because remember, cancer doesn't just affect your physical self and your emotional self, it can affect your financial self too, which for a lot of patients, particularly in this country, makes a big difference. Then there were questions about Marijuana and natural treatments, again, really in its infancy in terms of the research coming out from this uh, area. Hopefully in a future segment that we'll add as bonus materials to this course, I hope to have a conversation with one of our naturopaths here at Yale who can maybe enlighten us on some of the data that's going on in that space. 
In terms of marijuana, especially with the legal challenges surrounding medical marijuana, this has been something that has been difficult to study. But we're still learning about this. And in terms of other therapies, natural therapies, remember that a lot of that is not regulated. So whereas the FDA really regulates drugs so that when you get a particular drug at a particular dose, you know exactly what you're getting. In terms of vitamins and hormonal therapies uh, that you buy in drugstores, uh, a lot of the supplements, that's not regulated. And so while the label may look the same from box to box, from manufacturer to manufacturer, we really don't know that that is exactly the same, which makes doing studies a little bit more difficult, and it makes the regulation in terms of how we apply that knowledge to our patients a little bit more troubling as well. But it's an interesting area for future study, and hopefully our naturopath will be able to give us more information on that. So I hope this has been helpful for you. I encourage you to continue to use the discussion boards. Write to us with your questions. We love your feedback. Let us know whether segments like this are helpful to you. Um, we're always trying to improve the course. Until next time, this is Dr. Anise Chagpar.